Chapter 1, Nature, Humanity, and the First River Valley Societies. And the air we're looking at is from the emergence of human beings to 1500 BCE. So understand that that's BCE, not CE, not, not uh, you know, 600 years ago. Uh, what, what is it? 3,700 years ago, a long time ago. Uh, okay, so chapter 1, uh, the main points of this chapter, early humans, the agricultural revolution, Mesopotamia, and Egypt. Uh, so this is right out of your book. Uh, the first part of the book is entitled The Emergence of Human Communities to 1500 BCE. And this is kind of a description of where we're going here. We examine important patterns of human communal organization, primarily in the Eastern Hemisphere. Small, dispersed human communities li living by foraging spread to most parts of the world over ten, tens of thousands of years. They responded to enormously diverse environmental conditions at different times and in different ways, discovering how to cultivate plants and utilize the products of domestic animals. On the basis of these new modes of sustenance, populations grew, permanent towns appeared, and political and religious authority based on collection and control of agricultural surpluses spread over extensive areas. So in a, in a nutshell, you, you go from hunter-gatherer communities, foraging, uh, but over time you, you discover and learn how, about agriculture, how to, how to you know, plant and harvest using animals for your labor. Uh, and because of that, the hunter-gatherer settlements stayed put. They don't, they don't have to run around anymore looking for food and shelter. They stay put and they manage their crops and that becomes as time goes on you know communities and of course these communities would grow and they become uh, towns and in some cases they keep keep going and become large cities today um, so what do they mean by the eastern hemisphere well there's two hemispheres in the world uh, there's the eastern hemisphere that we're talking about here refers to on the on the right here <clears throat> refers mostly to Europe <clears throat> Asia and Africa also Australia and then the Western Hemisphere, of course, is the United States and South, North, and South America. Uh, so that's what they mean by Eastern and Western Hemisphere. Okay, the first section in your chapter is entitled Early Humans. And the question your textbook asks is, in light of scientific advances in our understanding of human origins, what have we learned about our relationships to the Earth and other living species? Okay, so we truly are starting at the very, very beginning here. I don't mean the beginning of time, uh, but beginning of, of humanity. When, when humans emerge, like I said, they go from hunter-gatherers, for, you know, foraging every day for their food. Uh, and, of course, they'll, as time goes on, they'll evolve into staying put with agriculture. Uh, and what's interesting about this is when you go way back the time of the last Ice Age, the Eastern and Western Hemisphere were connected by ice bridges between the Bering Strait. Um, but then what happens is um, this, this, uh, this ice age melted. And when, the, when it melted, that land bridge went with it and the continents were separated. And over a period of time, each one forgot about the other. So the significance of Columbus, of course, many, many years later, would be he's the one that kind of brings them back together quite by accident, but he's the one that, that, that essentially runs into North and South America by accident. And this is when Europe becomes aware that there's a, there's a whole other continent or two over there that we didn't know about. And the world is finally kind of brought back together. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but this is how it happens. The ice age melts, the continents separate, you know, lakes overflowed you know, based on, on, on the melt, and this creates river valleys. This is very important to early uh, humanity. Uh, civilizations gathered around these large river valleys, okay? And we're looking at, at, at you know, f uh, a few areas of the very first uh, settlements of, of human beings. Uh, the Nile uh, on the left here in Egypt, um, uh, the Tigris and Euphrates in Mesopotamia, the Indus and Ganges in India, and the Yellow River, as well as the Yangtze River in China. Uh, <clears throat> uh, humans tended to gather around these river valleys because it was a great place to grow 
because the river brings nutrients and minerals from the mountains with the melt. And by the time it gets down to draining into the ocean, it's depositing all these minerals and, and nutrients in the soil before it does. So it's a great place to grow crops. Uh, interestingly, early on, there were there were really no people in the Americas. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't mean no no uh, you know species at all. I mean humans. There was no humans. Uh, but later, going back to that that ice bridge, they came over on that bridge, uh, the Bering Strait, and that's when humanity came to North and South America. Of course, again the the uh, uh, ice the ice bridge melted and it separated them. Uh, so, but but like like their counterparts in in the Eastern Hemisphere, the people in the Western Hemisphere also congregated around river valleys, the Mississippi River in what would become the United States, and then further down in South America, the Amazon River, two huge population centers based on those rivers. So these river valleys were important because, like I said before, how fertile they were, nutrients and minerals from deep inland. And then these, these rivers would flood. Most rivers do. We, we've controlled it today with irrigation and so on. But in those days, they, they wanted it to flood. Because if the if the river floods over over the flat land by you know by the coast, it's going to deposit all those all those nutrients and they can grow uh, on the valley floors, making it, so so it turned the, the soil into very fertile soil. Okay, so going back to the uh, the first humans that, that emerged, this this happened, and this is according to science. You see that little purple that little purple smudge right here on the on the right side. This is an area in, in Africa called the Great Rift Valley. <clears throat> and this is where human beings emerged according to science. <clears throat> this happened 200,000 years ago, not, not very far away in the you know, scheme of history. Uh, so it's important to understand that, that humans are one species. There's no subspecies. Many animal types have subspecies, not humans. Humans are all the same, okay? All the same. Uh, so they start to move out slowly, <clears throat> ever so slowly, uh, and they 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 spread out to Africa. I, I'm I'm sorry, out of Africa to the Middle East, and that was possibly as early as 160,000 years ago. So imagine that it took them 40,000 years. Uh, to, to go from this valley here to say let's up up in here 40,000 years to get that far you know why do you suppose it took so long well because their their lives were completely different than ours they had it going way back no fire you didn't have the ability to cook food you didn't have light at night your entire every day of your life was absolute survival that, that wild animals didn't kill you that you had enough food to feed you and your tribe and that you had a safe place to sleep every night. So you don't have a lot of free time to ponder, you know, what's out in the world. All you can think about is staying alive, okay? Uh, modern humans only became well-established elsewhere in the last 50,000 years. So it took them 150,000 years from their emergence to spread around the world. Uh, that's an awful, awful long time. Okay, let's start with the film here. Please watch the uh, the film, the Crash Course film. So I show a lot of Crash Course films. Uh, they are somewhat geared toward the social media generation. They're, they're not so stuffy and dry like most documentaries. Very funny. Uh, but they also have a, a point of view that's not Eurocentric or just about the great white man that we talked about. You know, it kind of tells the story of everybody and it's, and it's, it, it's equal and fair to everybody that was there. So go ahead and watch that film and then come on back. <clears throat> okay, so the religious counter to uh, evolution, okay, is creation and uh, and the Garden of Eden. So this this Garden of Eden uh, took place or is located, was located in uh, what was known as uh, ancient Mesopotamia. T today it's, it's Iraq. So you have the Persian Gulf right here, and here you see those two rivers kind of coming together side by side. That's these two rivers, very, very famous ancient rivers, uh, the Tigris and Euphrates. This is where the original first you know, settlements were, uh, but also believed to be where the Garden of Eden, Eden was, okay? 
So, so again, the religious counter to evolution is is creation. God created Adam and Eve. Okay, uh, and then later with Noah's Ark, uh, God decided that He had enough of of the selfishness and greed of humans, so He's going to flood the earth and kill all the all the people except for the people that Noah's people. And God instructed Noah to build an ark and to put a male and female species of all the animals so they would endure. Um, so whether you believe in evolution or creation, it, it doesn't really matter it, it, as far as the story goes. It, it, either one fits into, this, into the history here. Uh, you're, uh, okay, I'm sorry. So let's, let's go on to, so, to, to the early humans. Um, so whether it was Africa or the Middle East, humans eventually migrated to all the points of the globe. Uh, now, people in the Middle East typically uh, were light brown skinned, right? Not white, not black. Uh, if humans bees started all in one place, doesn't that mean that we're all related to each other, regardless of skin color? Where did skin color come from? Why, why are some people lighter, some people are darker? Especially when scientists today uh, claim that humans are 98 to to 99% genetically the same. Doesn't matter your race, your gender, doesn't matter. We're 98 to 99% genetically the same. And this has been proven, according to science, with DNA evidence. Uh, so is, is, it, is it still a theory? Is Darwin's theory still a theory? If you go down to uh, letter C there, every organism faces a constant struggle to survive. The picture at the bottom, you, this, this poor little guy hasn't learned how to survive. It looks like his, his days are numbered. Uh, so animals adapt to their environment to survive. And the ones that, that do that carry on. Survival of the fittest. For a very simplistic example, a couple here. Uh, one is a you know little amphibian. It's crawling around the jungle floor. But elephants keep on stepping on them and squishing them. If that happens to all of his people all of his amphibian people, whatever you want to call them, they would become extinct. They're not surviving their environment. So they develop a shell over, you know, evolution takes thousands of years, but they develop a shell, become a turtle. Now when the elephant's coming, the turtle can go inside of a shell. The elephant can step on the shell and not squish the amphibian. That, that species survives and lives on. They, have, they are survival of the fittest. They've, they've managed to survive their environment. A, an animal that can't reach the fruit at the top of the tree uh, is going to starve and, and, and die. If, if all of his species do the same thing, they're going to become extinct. So they grow a long neck. And now they're giraffes. They can get, get fruit at the top of the tree. I mean, it sounds kind of simplistic and maybe even silly, but what is the purpose of a giraffe having a neck like that? It, it, it's, to, it's to reach something. Typically, animals want food. So... Uh, so once you have these adaptations to help you survive your environment, organisms then pass those traits on to their offspring. Okay. Uh, so this is this is Darwin's theory: a species adapts to its environment, changes occur to allow the species to survive, and that is called Darwin's survival of the fittest. Uh, so let's get back to this idea or this question: if if everyone's the same. Then why do we look different? You know, why do we have different skin color? And it's it's all about it's all about evolution. Going back to the Middle East where people started, uh, you light brown skin people. Uh, but now you decide, let's go out and see what's out there. So so one group goes north. So if you go way north from there, let's let's say you go up into what today is Sweden and Norway and Denmark and and you know all those places way up there. What's it like up there? Um, it's it's cold, really. Probably most of the year, it's. It, it, I don't think it ever gets really hot up there, but in the winter time, it's very very cold. But 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 most importantly, you also do not have a lot of sun in the winter, even in the summer, not as much sun as say we would get here. Uh, so your your exposure to sun is limited up up there. So what happens to a person of any skin color today? What happens when you are not exposed to the sun very much? Your skin starts to fade 
and it gets lighter. Okay, you become more pale. Uh, so the people that went north and stayed there, they, their skin adapted to the environment because they didn't need, need darker skin to survive up there and it became pale. This is where white skin came from, okay, according to science. Uh, let's go back to our group in the Middle East. Let's say the, another group decides to go south. Uh, they go down into Africa, deep into Africa, down by the equator. What's it like there? It's very, very hot, very, very humid. The sun, the sun shines, you know, all the time there. It's very hot. That pale person up in, up in uh, northern Europe would come to Africa and burn up in one day out in that kind of sun. So the people that went down into Africa to survive, they developed darker skin because darker skin won't burn as easy. Um, and there you have it. So you have white skin and black skin developing out of people that started with light brown skin, okay? Uh, simplistic perhaps, but that's an overall view of, of how this happened. And I mean, honestly, if you look at that and, and believe that, it really does solve a lot of uh, problems like race and inferiority, superiority, all these types of things that we still struggle with and fight about in the streets nearly every day. If everyone understood this, perhaps that, that problem would, would fade. Uh, okay, a couple of terms from your book that, that are important <clears throat> that you'll see continuously throughout this class. Uh, the first one is culture. Uh, so what does culture mean? C culture is socially transmitted patterns of action and expression. Material culture refers to physical objects such as dwellings, clothing, tools, crafts. Culture also includes arts, beliefs, knowledge, technology. So culture is really kind of shared patterns of action that we all do because that's just what we learn. We socialize that way. We, we wear the same clothes. We listen to the same music. We, we, we tend to be this way or that way. And then you go to a different country and they do things a little differently. That's their culture because they've, they've been over there. We've been over here. We, we, we kind of develop our way. They develop their way. It doesn't mean one's better or worse. It just means that it's different. Okay, that's the... That's the key to humanity is it's different. Okay, people are different based on where they where they came from. <clears throat> uh, but a word that's associated with culture and this this one you got to be careful with is civilization, an ambiguous term. So ambiguous right off the bat it, it tells you to be careful. Like watch what you're doing here. What, what, you know, be be careful of how you define this. What does ambiguous mean? It means it's a term that's open to more than one interpretation. So so one person might see it one way. Another person might see it another way, uh, or it has several possible meanings. Uh, you know, it might mean something else to to, to somebody else. Uh, what a what a uh, what an American thinks civilization is might be different in Australia. They might see it different. So what is what is civilization? It, it's an ambiguous term, often used to denote more complex societies, but sometimes used by anthropologists to describe any group of people sharing a set of cultural traits. So it, it uh, so it, it's utilizing culture. We talked about that a minute ago. Uh, it's taking those th that those cultural traits and spreading the, uh, across a people, you know, a, a, a large number of, of, of people. But where you got to be careful is when you talk about more complex societies, you know, complex, advanced, superior, all those words can get you in trouble because not everybody sees sees it the same way. You know, one culture might not see the technology as the end all, and we have to, you know, uh, do everything in our power to keep pushing the envelope of technology. You know, simplistic is better for some people. A perfect example would be uh, the Native Americans that were here, uh, but then what became the United States, living for uh, probably fifteen thousand years coming across the Bering uh, Sea again, the ice bridge, uh, spreading out in the North and South America, but doing just fine, not suggesting that they didn't have wars and nasty people like anybody else, humans are humans, but they had a lifestyle that was more about the earth and living you know, in tune with the earth, tread lightly on the earth, don't abuse it, uh, don't have private property, don't have fences, the earth, mother earth is for everybody. And they got along just fine doing that for 15,000 years. That was their culture. 
that was how they saw civilization. They didn't see it as cities with lights and people and bustling working and, and manufacturing goods for things that, that everyone wants. They, did, they, they, they had a more simple life. But then the Europeans come and, they, and they're all about profit and opportunity and making money. And they tear up the earth. You know, taking mountaintops, looking for gold, you know, uh, chopping down a forest to build a city or to plant, you know, fishing out lakes and streams to, to not just eat the fish, but sell it at a, lo at a large, in large volume. But if it, but all the fish are gone. So natives couldn't understand wh why are you doing this to this lamb? We, we get so much from this lamb, but the, but the Europeans saying, yes, so are we. We're getting rich off this lamb. So two different points of view, but is one uncivilized and one is not? Well, of course, the, the Europeans deem that the natives were uncivilized because they weren't taking advantage of all these opportunities. They weren't, um, in, in their minds, they were lazy. And they, and they you know, you, you have this mountain right there. You could be mining gold and you're, you're, you're over here not doing that. What's the matter with you? So the point I'm trying to make is they had, both of them had, successful civilizations everybody was living and had some some type of hierarchy with the leaders and the government and there was laws and you know rules to fall like anybody else but lived completely different I, I wouldn't suggest that one was better than the other at all uh, but that's where that's where civilization can that, that work can get you into trouble okay another word that we look at is ethnocentrism we talked about that in the uh, introductory lecture one of them about you know what that is this idea that the emotional attitude that one's own race nation or culture is superior to all others so again the Europeans came saw the natives thought we're better than you are are we're white you're not we're a stronger nation we're more powerful our culture is is about technology and and yours is just so simple we're better than you well you know not, not necessarily um, just different different points of view so ethnocentrism if you've had my classes before i know some of you have this is a huge theme for me in all my classes this is something that's very 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 important to understand because this is the roots of all evil or at least part of it part of the roots okay the webster definition is having the idea or based on the idea that your own group or culture is better or more important than others superior and you're inferior it doesn't always have to be a group or it could be a country, it could be a state, a city, it, it could be a religion, it could be your religion, it could be your school, it could be the kind of car you have. You know, I mean, automobiles are important, but they become status symbols. So suddenly now I got a better car than you, I'm better than you. Is that really true? I have an old truck that I drive and, and I, I love that truck and it gets me around. And I don't I don't have any need for anything else. So. But people say, why do you drive that old truck? Because I like that truck. I, I have a different point of view about this. It doesn't mean I'm wrong. Um, so ethnocentrism is a very important thing to understand because it's probably the roots of racism and discrimination. Uh, it's a human trait to believe our way is the only way, the right way, and everyone else is inferior. Uh, we can, this idea can also be used in civilizations. The misinterpretations of people who lash out at others who are not like them uh, paints world history. Let's say that again. The misinterpretations of people who lash out at others who are not like them paints world history. Uh, and many times, in fact, most times, if a group is deemed to be uncivilized by another or seen as inferior, that becomes a justification for cruelty and oppression. So again, Native Americans and Europeans, they abused them and tortured them and, and you know, found ways to get rid of them uh, because they saw them as not as good as they were. They were human beings just like they were, but they, you know, they don't see it that way. So this idea that's of inferiority has led to lots of problems in world history and the roots of warfare, aggression, and oppression, okay? Okay, so let's let's go back to the, just briefly to kind of set the stage for where humans came from. Primates, what is a primate besides kind of cute, cuddly little guys, right? <laughs> a primate is a member of the most developed and intelligent group of mammals. 
that includes humans, monkeys, and apes. Uh, first seen on Earth 65 million years ago. Now, don't misunderstand that human beings were not here 65 million years ago. Primates were. And primates is where humans evolved from. But again, we determined earlier in the lecture, 200,000 years ago is when humans emerged. Okay, So interesting, though. Humans are in the same category as monkeys and apes. Uh, that used to be a huge argument against the idea of evolution. Uh, many humans don't like the idea of being related to apes or monkeys. Uh, and, you know, okay, I understand that on some level, but if you're going to, let, let's just say evolution is, is the truth. If you're going to choose an animal that humans uh, evolved from, you're not going to choose a bird or a giraffe or, or a snake, right? Which which what species looks the closest to human beings? It's apes, without question. Uh, so the truth is, there, there's been much archaeological evidence recovered in Africa. Again, back to that Great Rift Valley that suggests that the cradle of humanity is related to the habitat of apes, the type of apes found in Africa in the Great Rift Valley that aren't found anywhere else on Earth. That's where humans came from. And humans came from the same area. Okay. There's also been much archaeological evidence uncovered since the time of Darwin to further prove his theories. Today, most scientists do not consider it a theory anymore. They see it as a fact. Um, for years, it was believed that, the, that Darwin's theory had a missing link. And that was why, you know, people, I, I'm not going to believe that. He doesn't have it all connected yet. You start with this this creature, and they evolve to this creature, to that creature, but then you then you're missing a couple, and then you jump ahead a little bit, and that was you know the the downside is argument that it's <clears throat> it's not linked it's not linked or proven completely yet. Let's watch a film here. Please watch the film entitled "Missing Link in Human Evolution Science," and then come on back. Okay, so. Uh, the, the truth is, apes and monkeys are a species with a lot in common to humans. And, and like what? Well, hands, fingers, legs, arms, and perhaps most importantly, a thumb. One of, one of the things that separate us from animals is our thumbs. Think about it. No animal has a thumb but an ape and humans. Uh, I went to a, a, a seminar four or five years ago about uh, evolution in Darwin. And it was all the leading scientists of our present day, leading evolutionary scientists. And they were talking about evolution and blah, blah, blah. And I raised my hand. I said, you know, for, for years there was a missing link. Is there still a missing link? Or have you, and then they said, no, it's no, it's no longer a missing link. And nobody in the scientific world sees this as as a theory anymore. This is absolute fact to science. Now, I'm not trying to sell you that. I'm just telling you what I, what the man's told me. Uh, I, I realize this is a very, very emotional subject, creation, God, science, evolution. I, <clears throat> I get it. Uh, but I'm just telling you what, of what, you know, the, the things I've seen and heard, okay? Okay, next is a hominid. So it's starting to look a little bit more like, like human-like, okay? Uh, so who's who's a hominid? What's a hominid? The biological family that includes humans and human-like primates. So if you go back to the primates, the ones that are human-like, okay, become are hominids. And these 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 this species that were first seen on the Earth seven million years ago, okay. So there, so we're 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 moving up the ladder here slowly, okay. So there's three traits that distinguish humans from apes. And other primate. This is where humans separate themselves. Three things. Number one, walking upright on two legs. Why is that important? Frees the four limbs from any role in locomotion. Also, the development of thumbs, like I mentioned, that allow humans to, mani to manipulate objects skillfully. Okay. So think about it. Imagine if you had to use your arms to for locomotion, for for trap, for walking. We walk on two legs. We're carrying our keys, our books, our purse, our groceries, our mail, whatever it is, our jacket, whatever it might be, we've got two arms. I don't know about you, but when I come home, I, I, I don't want to go out and make two trips, so I load it all up, 
and then I can't get my keys to open the door, but I'm kind of lame that way. But you know what I'm saying. I can walk and stop and talk to my neighbor. I can duck my head out of the way of the, of the kid's ball flying through the air, whatever it might be. Um, I can respond to somebody. I, I, I can stop and squint my eyes in the sun while I'm carrying stuff, while I'm walking. My brain allows me to walk and carry things without having to think about it. <clears throat> now, what if you said to your dog, go out to my car and get me my briefcase, my jacket, and my mail? And your dog loves you, wants to please you, so he runs out there. What, what's that dog going to do? And you love your dog, a smart dog, but what's he going to do? He's got no thumb. He's got no fingers. He's got no hands. They have paws. But they need all four of those paws to, to, to go to the car and come back, right? To locomote, to move. So what do they do? They carry things in their mouth because that's all they've got left, right? That's the That's the... That's where humans have you kind of emerged away from, although they're still part of it, the animal kingdom. And this is where humans have kind of risen above it all. Uh, and there's there's that superior word again, but you, you know what I'm saying. This is how humans have evolved to a place where they're at today and left every all the other animals behind. They don't have that ability, okay? Larger brain. Uh, larger brain just means more more brain matter to think with. It also allows us to think abstractly, not just always just the obvious, okay? Although a lot of people that I know just seem to think just the obvious. They don't have any kind of abstract ability at all. I'm kidding. But um, what does abstractly mean? It means that instead of just always thinking about what's in front of you, okay, there's a street. I'm going to walk down it. You're looking at the mountains. You know, I wonder what's on the other side of that mountain. Or, you know, I wonder what that, where that trail goes here. And, and, you know, boy, there's a lot of stars up there. I wonder, you know, what, what, what's, what are all those little stars up there? It's thinking beyond just the obvious in your life. Animals don't do that. And animals don't, don't think like that. They're, 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 they're simple minded creatures that mostly are looking for food. Okay. Uh, because we think abstractly, we can ex experience profound emotions, profound love hate, anger, sadness, uh, bitterness, revenge, okay, all these types of things, goodness, benevolence, uh, these are all profound emotions that animals don't feel. And we construct complex relationships. We have relationships with people, friendships, marriages, uh, whatever it might be, that animals don't get that deep, okay? Uh, Number three, a larynx or voice box. Now, I'm, I'm not a, a biologist, so don't ask me what, what this entirely is about. I'm an historian. Uh, but in humans, the voice box is located lower in the neck than other primates. Apparently, this allows humans to create a wide range of sounds that leads to the formation of language. So think about an animal. Think about a bear. A bear just kind of you know, roars, lions roar, dogs bark, cats meow, whatever it might be. But that's really all they do. They can't squeak and talk high and staccato. and They, they, they can't make up, you know, different sounds. They can't sing, right? Think about, about that. Um, because they don't have an advanced voice box like a larynx like we do. So over time, going way, way back to those first humans, over time, in a, in a tribe or whatever it was, civilization, a group, these people determined that that sound will mean hello, this sound will mean goodbye, this sound will mean it's time to eat, and slowly, simplistically, language is developed. And now here we, here we are today, uh, you know, we, we have all kinds of, of, you know, things we can talk about. I'm talking to you right now, not very well, but I do my best. Uh, so imagine an animal, imagine animals sitting around talking. They, they don't because they can't, they can't do it. So those are the three things that, that distinguish humans from apes and so on. This idea of walking upright on two legs is called bipedalism. Very, very, very important. A huge development to free your hands to do other things besides walking while you're walking. Uh, okay. So. Like I said, human beings, like other animals, have evolved based on their environment and their needs, okay?
and we and we continue to evolve and who knows what we'll look like in in 10,000 years okay okay so just just briefly here um, so we talked about hominids uh, 7 million BCE uh, this is kind of up the up the evolution chain to the modern homo sapiens Australopithecines you know say that about 10 times in a row uh, 4.5 million years ago BCE uh, homo habilis or the handy human and of course everyone laughs about the word homo okay so understand what homo means in in, in this context it, it used to mean man <clears throat> okay man like the species of human <clears throat> we always call it man mankind you know we're, we're, we're trying to be a more equitable people so we don't call it that too much anymore humanity is what we call it because let's face it it's not just man there's women also right and they're just as big a part of it as man is uh, <clears throat> so that's what that's what homo means when you see that in front of a you know something else so homo hobless you know again the one of the first ones to really utilize their hands and their thumbs and you're, you're having tool making and shelter making and you know you're, you're taking a more advanced brain <clears throat> and, and you're using your hands with it and you're developing things that no animal could ever do okay homo erectus that, that gets a real big laugh but again erectus means standing erect nothing else okay upright human again bipedalism and uh, but also strength and posture and balance I mean most animals I mean go back to your dog go back to your cat your dog can't walk across the room on two legs I mean some might hop and have a little bit of, a, of an ability but they can't walk across the room and go outside like like we do we have absolute balance our, our brain has evolved to allow us to stand up way up here with only two legs holding us up and not fall over okay okay so we know very little about these species because they are prehistoric only archaeological findings tell us anything so prehistoric what does that mean uh, it's a period of time before people invented a system of writing and they typically had no cities no central governments or complex inventions they're they're evolving okay uh, you know after you develop a language the next thing you do is develop a way to write that language down so this is all steps in in, the, in this evol evolving so before the written word is the is the key to what prehistoric means they didn't leave us any kind of you know books and volumes of, of books to tell us what they did you know three million years three thousand whatever years ago whatever it was uh, so archaeology and anthropology fill in the blanks for us the best they can but there's never going to be a way that we'll know entirely what these people did uh, so it's a slow process uh, so going back to the Stone Age one of the one of the first basic ages okay when after humans evolved uh, so why do they call it the Stone Age because the tools were made from rocks and stones this is pre metal this is before the metal revolutions or the metal ages okay uh, you sc scrapers and, and hammers and weapons and arrow tips spear tips all made from rock or stone uh, so this this begins 2.6 million years ago so not humans okay way way back to 3300 BCE so by that time you do have humans and it's around that time that you have the discovery of metals starts the Bronze Age but just just for right now let's stay in the in the Stone Age and talk about a couple of important eras of the Stone Age on the left the Paleolithic Age in that age men hunted for food and women collected food from trees berries and seeds and this is the hunter gatherers but this is also the era where fire was discovered I, I wouldn't say invent but you know what are you gonna do it's a slide uh, nobody invented it it was always around they discovered it they discovered how to harness it and, and manage it okay uh, and then the next age on the right <clears throat> the Neolithic age this is hugely important to human beings and who we are today people learned how to grow the food and people domesticated animals to do their work they invented agriculture and farming so people stay still stay, stay sedentary they, and they don't move around so much okay uh, okay 
So just briefly, fire is is an amazing moment, and that that had to be uh, perhaps the largest turning point in the evolution of humans is fire. Imagine life before fire. You're cold at night. It's pitch black. You're eating raw meat. You're eating seeds and fruit and whatever. Everything's raw. It's hard on your body. Your digestive system can't handle that very well. So people don't live very long because your body gets worn out. Uh, but but also um, uh, safety at night because uh, because these these roaming uh, tribes of hunter gatherers, you know, these are humans. They're not or, or or on their way to becoming humans. They're not fast or ferocious or they don't have big jaws and they don't have claws. They're easy prey for animals. And animals knew that, so so the animals are hunting them for a food source. So every single day, you had to look for a cave. Or this is where the cliche caveman comes from. Okay, you're looking for a place to stay at night, but before fire, it was just pitch black. I mean, imagine how scary it must have been for these people. So fire is a a a huge huge moment that revolutionized the lives of humans. You can cook your food now. You can cook meat, and my gosh, it tastes good cooked compared to raw. And you can digest it easier. You can boil your vet vegetables and make them softer. You know, all these things. So completely, uh, perhaps the most important moment in um, in uh, the development of humans. Uh, so going back to the Bering Strait, uh, for a short time during the Ice Age, from about 100,000 to 11,000 years ago, again, all the continents were connected by land. Uh, because much of the upper north regions of the world were frozen, including the Bering Strait. So today, of course, the Bering Strait uh, is still there, and it separates Russia, the tip of Russia right here, to Alaska. So Russia and the United States are really uh, a little over 50 miles apart. That's the, that's the Bering Strait, that was, that was, but it was all ice. It was a huge ice bridge, okay? That's how they came over here. I, I know I'm repeating myself. Uh, okay, where am I here? So they came across when it was frozen. Uh, and that's why people have been here far fewer years in Europe, Africa, or Asia. But again, once it melted, uh, the two halves were isolated. And, and this is this is where the question is is asked. And this, again, goes back to racism and, you know, inferiority I, the idea of that and the question has been that the western hemisphere didn't evolve like the eastern hemisphere did that the eastern hemisphere evolved you know better and i mean i don't i've never really seen any evidence of that talk about cities and and government and you know caring for people Tom of Columbus, the Aztecs in, in today, what would be Mexico City, Tenochtitlan, were far more advanced at the time of Columbus than anything going on in Europe or Asia at the time. Anything, not even close. Uh, so this idea that the West uh, evolves slower or differently or not they're not as smart as Eastern Hemisphere, and because the Europeans came, that's what changed it. Nonsense. They, they were as evolved as anybody else. Uh, Unfortunately, you know, most of world history, Western civilization, American history, it's it's from a European perspective. It's Eurocentric, not ethnocentric. Same idea. Eurocentric means anything from Europe's the best. We're smarter. We're braver. We're stronger. We're, we we you know have accomplished more. Our scientists are better. Yeah, you know, that's that's the way we've been taught history. Uh, ethnocentric. Okay. Um, okay, back to our back to our Stone Age, as as humans are evolving. Uh, so you know, life had to be, had to be pretty miserable, but it evolved, and those very early people started to develop communities, uh, and that's where our next section is. What made them start communities? Why did they stop running around? I've already said it, but we're moving to the next section here. Uh, so understand, but it's all still part of evolution. Their their lives were spent trying to survive their environment, and that's where these evolution 
evolutionary adaptations come from. They're, they're trying to survive and it moves into a direction and that direction is, is what? Agriculture. This changed the entire history of humanity and set the stage for who we are today because our entire lives even today you could argue still is about agriculture because it's trade and trade's a huge a huge part of humanity so the question asked in the second next section here how did plant and animal domest domestication set the scene for the emergence of complex societies so what were the agricultural revolutions it was the change from food gathering hunter gathering to food production so food gathering to food production Circa means somewhere around that time, 8,000 and 2,000 BCE. Wide range there, but it didn't happen all at the same time at, at all points of the globe. It, it took a while. <clears throat> this is also known as the Neolithic Revolution. So it was the agriculture revolutions that dramatically changed their lives. People stayed put, started communities. Populations began to increase. Uh, groups of sedentary people staying still. They developed in the centers of trade. Okay, uh, and there were two significant complex societies that developed in this era, and we're going to talk about them both in the next, in the in part two here. I'm about to wrap part one up here. Each one of these centered around a river valley. Both developed in this era between 3500 and 1500 BCE. Okay. Let's take another break here and watch another Crash Course film. Please watch the Crash Course film uh, entitled Agriculture Revolutions and then come on back. Okay, so the discovery of agriculture, planting crops, and utilizing the labor of animals to help them. A huge moment. This resulted in people staying together in groups in different places. There, <clears throat> there was no need to move around and forage anymore. And because of this, structures appeared, political and religious order takes shape. <coughs> Excuse me. Got something stuck in my throat here all of a sudden. <clears throat> uh, class distinctions began based on your spot on the power totem pole. So it's important to understand that the control of agriculture is where the idea of power comes from. A distinct class system developed very early once you got out of hunter-gatherers. I mean, the hunter-gatherers had a hierarchy also, but but not like it became in a in a in a city in a in a settlement. You have a very small elite at the top, the ones that run the show, and so like a pyramid at the top, you have a small group of people that that have all the wealth and the power, and they tell everybody else at the bottom of the pyramid what to do. And from that point on, this is very important to understand this. That from that point on. The rest of the people's labors were designed to serve that elite. <clears throat> so political power arose. Why? Because you had to organize the labor. Uh, it took a lot of labor to develop these early agricultural societies. You had to gain control of the river. <clears throat> so you had to build dams and irrigation channels. This is a lot of hard work. Uh, these areas were, in some cases, were arid or dry. Uh, you have a big river, but not a lot of rainfall. So how do you get the people to do the work? You need leadership. So from the very beginning, leadership and authority, uh, you know, developed because someone had to get these people to work. So understand that all this labor and all this gain of all this food and so on, it was not designed to be a benefit for everyone. It was designed to be a benefit for the people at the top. Yes, the people at the bottom could eat, but not very much. And they never have much of a chance to ever better their lives. They're just simply peasants that work for the elite at the top. This, this is the early River Valley societies. Uh, it required leaders who could organize labor. It required large groups of people to work together. Uh, I mean, do you think that the people that were determined to be laborers, do you think that they are happy about being laborers? Probably not. Do you think they wanted to go out there and pick crops in the hot sun and build dams and do all these things? Probably not. So how do you get them to do it? It has to be done. Well, probably by force or threat. So you have to start the working class versus the ruling class. And the subjugation of the people, the vast majority of the population is subjugated by small minority. 
to do the hard labor to to accomplish what the what the civilization needs. And in some cases, the start of slavery, where you absolutely control somebody somebody's life and and you force them to do do hard labor for you, uh, or it might cost them their lives. Uh, so in those days, way way back in, until the exploration of the of the Americas, going back five six thousand maybe more years. Slaves in those days were prisoners of war, POWs, they were in debt, or they were criminals. Uh, their time as a slave would end like a sentence. In, in many cases, a slave would be forced to wear a distinctive hairstyle to identify themselves as, as a slave to the rest of the population. But once their time was up as a slave, they could remove that and, and carry on as a human being. It, it was not until the formation of the Americas, North and South, when slavery became determined by the color of your skin. It was never about that before. Slaves were all different colors. It was all about who you were. Uh, and, and, and also in America, slavery would become for life. It had, that had not been a situation before. Now it's for life. And it's passed on by the mother's bloodline. Okay, so in, in, in America, if your mother was black, then so were you didn't matter what you look like even though you know inner you know mixing of, of whites and blacks created lighter skinned black uh, african-american people black people um, if your mother had what was called the one drop rule one drop of black blood in her then you were forever a slave and in some cases as this went on over generations some some you know offspring of a of a woman could would, could look white and pass for white, but if it was determined that actually her mother is you know <clears throat> one um, fourth black or her grandfather was, and that that's all it took, and that white person became a slave also. And of course, this is where this age-old conflict began uh, between these two classes that of course still still go on today. And you can look at our at our system today. I mean, do we still live in this kind of system today? I mean, I, I wouldn't say, I mean, I would say no, of course not, but, but a whole lot of it still lingers. Understand where it came from, okay? It comes from way, way back, comes from way, way back, needing to, to, to utilize labor to survive and to force people to do that work. You know, it's the working class today, same thing. So we haven't changed that much from ancient times, okay? Um Okay, let's finish up with that. That is the end of part one of chapter one. Please go on to uh, chapter one, part two. Thank you.